There are good investments and there are bad investments. There are eternal investments and temporary investments. We have the opportunity to join Jesus in His mission to reach more people by leveraging our time, talents, and finances with every little decision to make a kingdom impact. Hey, once again, good morning, and uh, so glad that you are uh, with us today. Let's take our Bibles and go ahead and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Haggai. We've got about two chapters here, and we're going to be in the second chapter Today, and as uh, Jacob pointed up, we're kind of moving out of the book of Romans uh, just uh, until, well, through today. We'll finish it up in the next uh, couple of weeks, and so uh, I hope you've enjoyed being a part of that. The title of today's message is basically the same as it was last week, Eternal Investments. I have a friend that was part of the search team that called me here, the Lord called me, but worked through those guys about 18 years ago. And so he has my cell number, and so every now and then, just out of the blue, he'll send me a text. His text always generally reads this way, you are too blessed to be depressed, and you're too anointed to be disappointed. Now, I never, it never grows old. I always laugh when I get that text from him. And then he'll usually send another text and go, hey, I'm praying that you'll become larger and wider. I don't know what that means necessarily, you know, I hope it's not physical, but uh, it's usually that, but... He says, you're too blessed to be depressed. You know, it generally occurs and comes at a time when that's needed because discouragement is something probably that all of us at times are tempted maybe to fall into. It may be something that happens in our life. We live a lot of times in a a toxic culture and a toxic atmosphere, you know, and you may look out there at the world and say, hey, the world's in chaos and I'm kind of downhearted because of that. Well, let me just let you in on a secret. The world has always been in chaos. It has always been like it is. And, you know, if the Lord doesn't come back and rapture his church out of here and you continue to live, the economy is going to do this. It has always done this kind of stuff. And so, but I know there, in fact, there are a lot of things out there that can tempt you in in such a way to be discouraged. It's something that I would say probably all of us at some point in some way may deal with that. Whether you're a a lay person, maybe you're in business, or maybe you're a stay-at-home mom or something like that, there's issues and things that that come with that. The idea of discouragement is not something that is foreign to pastors. You know, you can have on Sunday like a Billy Graham crusade breaks out. The Holy Spirit of God falls. People are confessing sin. They are surrendering to the Lord. It's like a holy hallelujah day. You know, you're, you, you can just tell when the Lord is moving in such a way. You wake up on Monday morning, it's like, man, it was terrible. I didn't do anything right. And, you know, so sometimes as preachers kind of laugh about that. They usually call Monday that day of resignation for a lot of guys who are pastoring, isn't that? So, again, it's something that, to some degree, that, that people uh, face. And so, that's what we're going to work through in this passage today. You know, there was a, a, a great preacher of the past in the uh, 1700s, that he was known at the end of his time, he was known as the guy who was the most loved guy in England. His uh, name was John Wesley. He was the founder of Methodism, in fact, kind of the founder of the Methodist Church. He's been described as a great evangelist, theologian, but also a great songwriter. There is a copy of his diary that was found, and so in his diary, he had these words, Okay. Sunday a.m., May the 5th, preached in St. Anne's, was asked not to come back anymore. Sunday p.m., May the 5th, so Sunday night, preached at St. John's, deacon said, get out and stay out. Sunday a.m., May the 12th, preached in St. Jude's, can't go back there either. Sunday a.m., May the 19th, is a place called St. Somebody, deacons called a special meeting, said I couldn't return. Sunday p.m., May the 19th, preached on the street, kicked off the street. Sunday a.m., May the 26th, preached in a meadow, chased out of the meadow as a bull was turned loose during the service. Sunday a.m., June the 2nd, preached out on the edge of town, kicked off the highway. Sunday p.m., June the 2nd, afternoon, preached in a pastor, 10,000 people came to hear. You take a man like John Wesley for a month there, said he couldn't come back, couldn't do that. Again, there is a temptation to discouragement. You know, when I started 
Just a few minutes ago, I said, the text I would get, you're too blessed to be depressed, too anointed to be disappointed. I don't know what's going on in your life. I know life is not easy. I know it. I know there's hurts and pains and things that I can't fathom that you're going through. But let me encourage you with this. If you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Him, there's a few things that you need to know. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which nobody can take out. You are a blood-bought, blood-forgiven child of the King. This world may take your house. This world may take your children. This world may take your education. This world cannot take your soul. You are a child of the King. I don't know what's taking place presently in your life, but here's what I want to say to you. As a believer in Christ, you're too blessed to be depressed. You're too anointed to be disappointed. This world is throwing the junk at you every day and everything that's happening, and I want you to be encouraged as a child of the King. These people that we're going to read about here in Haggai, they, you know, had been released from captivity, a Babylonian captivity after a period of so many years, close to 70 years or so, to go back and rebuild the temple. Yet, what had happened was a, was opposition. We talked about this last week. There were excuses that were made, and the work had stalled for about 14 to 16 years, and they kind of started it back up. Hey, if you're able, if you don't mind, stand with me for the uh, public reading of Scripture. We'll pick up in chapter 2. Got just a few verses we'll look at this morning. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehazadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. So basically, it's a word of the Lord through Haggai the prophet to everybody that's there. He says, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage. You may have a Bible translation that says, be strong, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of the hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of the hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of of hosts. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to come together on this, this Sunday morning here uh, in November, Lord, cold Sunday morning. And Lord, we come together, worship, praise, exalt, give glory to you, lift you up, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your death at Calvary. Thank you for your blood that was shed. And Lord Jesus, thank you for coming out of that grave on the third day. And so, Lord, I pray you move and work. Give us illumination of the text. Give us understanding of the Scripture. There are those here today who need to be encouraged, Lord, who need to remember who they are uh, in you. It doesn't mean that the circumstances or events may change in their life, but, Lord, they can find peace in the midst of the storm through you. I pray you do that in their life. And, Lord, as always, I pray you save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Please be seated uh, if you would. So as we break this passage down, what we're going to see is we're going to see God's presence here, but we're also going to see God's provision as we kind of work through this uh, passage. We find ourselves here in chapter 2 that what has happened is the people have been working for about a month. It's very strategic and when Haggai is addressing the people, because you see it says the seventh month, but in the calendar, it's about the month of October, which 400 years earlier, Solomon, and this is the Feast of Tabernacles, Solomon dedicated the temple at the same time. So it's very uh, strategic in how this announcement's coming. So they've been working uh, on the temple, rebuilding it after it had been stagnant for 14, 16 years or so. And so it's very evident that what they're building is nothing like it was in the days of Solomon. In fact, so much that Haggai comes out and he says, look at it. He just calls it what? He said, look at it. <laughs> he says, how many of you were here? How many of you were here and saw the glory of the temple and the splendor of the temple before? So there were a few older people in the group that probably had 
seen it before. You, they say Solomon's temple was plastered with gold on the inside. I've never been in anything like that. I've only in my life uh, held a gold coin like one time. I've never seen like a bar of gold like you see on television. I've never been in a place that the walls were made. I go, can you imagine if you came into this place, this building, and then all of a sudden you had gold plaited on the walls? I mean, it'd be like you'd have to wear sunglasses if you were in here. I mean, that's the splendor of the temple. Solomon. That was the wealth of the temple. Well, what they're rebuilding is nothing in comparison. So much of Haggai, he says, look at it. He says, there are no words. He says, this here cannot compare to back then. But, and you see in the context though, what the Lord does encourage him, he says, but hey, no, it doesn't compare. It's not like that. But the Lord says, I am with you. He says, I'm with you. It's about his presence. You see, sometimes we get caught up in the past. We get caught up in the God of yesterday and forget that He's the God of today. We get caught up in the glory of the past, and, and we want to memorialize the past, and, and we all of a sudden make it something that it wasn't, that all of a sudden the future is something that's it's not either. And we get confused by this. You see, comparison is how, uh, it's how the enemy wants to deflate some of you. Social media, for example can be good or bad. It's neutral. And social media is made up of comparison in a lot of ways. You know, you'll find stuff, and so you may see something on Facebook or Twitter, and and so maybe there's a lady, and she's talking about her husband. Her husband's the best thing that there's ever been on the face of the earth. He picks his clothes up out of the floor. Nobody said anything. Gave you an opportunity. He picks his clothes up out of the floor. He takes his dishes to the sink. I mean, he's the best thing there's been where I came from, they said, since we got bread in the grocery store, you know. I mean, he's like it. Guess what? They're lying. They're lying to you. He's not that good. You say, oh, my husband's that good. No, he's not. He's not that good, really. You see, so we got a self-esteem issue today that's rolling around out there. And so people on social media, they, they make up stuff. They, they, they want to make up stuff about their family, make themselves look so good so they can feel good about themselves. When in fact, no, that stuff's really true. And then you find yourself looking at it thinking, man, I, I wish I was, I wish I was married to somebody like that. I wish my husband had it all together like he's got it together. You see, we find ourselves in a place of discouragement through comparison. This is what they were doing. These people standing around going, this is nothing like it used to be when I was in seminary. I went to seminary at age 30, knew absolutely nothing. All I knew is Christ died on the cross and rose again on the third day. And so, but I learned early on some stuff that I had no idea about. I would sit at a table and there'd be a bunch of young guys there, young guys, come out of Bible college. I didn't go to Bible college. I just went to a state school, you know, so come out of Bible college. And they would be making comments because we were in Memphis. And so we were close to Bellevue and Adrian Rogers coming, preaching in chapel. And these young boys would be standing stuff like, if I was Adrian Rogers, I'd do this. If I was Adrian Rogers, I'd do that. If I was Adrian, I finally held up my hand one day. I said, guess what? You ain't Adrian Rogers and you never will be Adrian Rogers. You know, I, I would just see that. We would get in preaching class. We had a preaching class. I thought I was going to be a missionary. I thought I was going to do ag stuff. I thought I was going to be somewhere like a satellite phone. You know, so Angie could call her mom and daddy. That's just how it's going to be. I never pictured myself passing a church, but I had to go through this preaching class. And there were just regular guys in the preaching class. But man, when they stood up to preach, and the Lord said, I'm like, who is that person up there? They changed their voice. They changed their inflection of the voice. They talked differently. They were formal. And I'm like, dude, you know, you, you worked at a funeral home and you're preaching and now who are you here? You know, and that, and, and his whole deal was like, they'll say, well, I'm going to be like Adrian Rogers. You know, you can set a goal to be like Dr. Adrian, but guess what? You're not Adrian Rogers, and God didn't put you at Bellevue. God has you right where you are for a purpose and a place. I want to encourage you this. Don't despise the small things. You can sit around and say, well, I'm, I'm not good enough, or I don't have enough education, or I can't ever do this. Do not despise the small things in life, because here's what, as a believer, here's what the Lord says, I'm with you. I am with you wherever. And don't think, well, I don't have enough to make a difference in life. Don't ever think, I don't, I don't have enough resources, I don't have enough abilities, I don't have enough spiritual gifts, I, don't, I can't do anything, I can't speak, I can't do this. Do not despise the small things in life. What, what God's presence does, He gives us the ability, the strength to press on, 
to persevere. I want to share a story with you. I, I've never heard this before. You probably have. I never heard it in a church anywhere. I've never used it as an illustration, but it was a, a six-year-old girl in the 1800s. Her name was Hattie Mae Wyatt, six-year-old girl. The story says she lived near Grace Baptist Church in Philadelphia. The Sunday school was very crowded. Russell H. Conwell, the minister, told her that one day they would have buildings big enough to allow everyone to attend. She said, well, I hope you will. It is so crowded that I'm afraid to go there by myself. She's a six-year-old girl. You know, as I read other stories regarding this, they said that it was so crowded they would have to turn kids away. Or kids would sit out in a hallway while the teacher's in a the room. They had that many kids coming to Sunday school to a, a Bible study at that time. And so this little girl said, I'm just kind of afraid because there's so many people there. He replied, when we get the money, we will construct one large enough to get all the children in. Sad story. Two years later, the age of eight, 1886, Hattie May died. After the funeral, Hattie's mother gave the minister a little bag that they had found under their daughter's pillow containing 57 cents in change that she had saved up. Alongside it was a note in her handwriting to help build bigger so that more children can go to Sunday school. The minister changed all the money into pennies and he offered each one for sale. The story says that he received $250. And that 54 cents, 54 pennies of the 57, were given back. The $250 was itself changed into pennies and sold by a newly formed Wyatt Might Society. In this way, her 57 cents kept on multiplying. 26 years later, in a talk entitled, The History of the 57 Cents, the minister explained the results of her 57 cent donation. A church with a membership of over 5,600 people, a hospital where tens of thousands of people had been treated, 80,000 young people were going through a university that they had helped start, and 2,000 people were going out to preach the gospel. All this happened because Hattie Mae White invested her 57 cents. Do not despise the small things in life. Never say, I can't have an impact. I can't have an influence. I can't do what God has called me to do. Quit comparing yourself. If God is with you, and He is as a believer, and He has you where He has you at this present time, then don't worry about what anybody else thinks. You don't have to impress anybody. You don't have to try to be somebody you're not. Hey, you can admit if you've failed, I've failed, I've made mistakes. I can't go back and get a redo, but I can go forward in God's grace. And be the person that God has called you to do. He gives you the, his presence allows us to press on. And here's what I know for all of us. Hey, there's some things here in life, whether it's your job or whatever it may be, that it's encouragement just to press on, keep on keeping on. His presence gives us that perseverance to do that. But also, here's another thing his presence does. He gives us courage. So there's three times he says, be encouraged or be strong, be strong, be strong. And I like, he says, get up and go to work. Quit sitting around looking at this thing. It's not what it was then, but it's okay, because I am here. I'm here. I'm in the midst. He says, I'm keeping my promise. Cloud by day, pillar fire by night. I'm keeping my promise. That as the children came out of Egypt, I will be with you. I will give you this life. I'm keeping my promise. Have courage. And he, he says this. He says, don't be afraid. Okay, a little survey, right? How many of you are afraid of failing? Okay, there's a lot of hands across here. Now, here's a business principle, <laughs> okay? Just to help you with this. Most people who have succeeded in life have failed many times before they got there. It's just a business principle is if, you, if you're afraid, fear of failing can keep you from moving forward in that. And you can just use that principle across the board. I, I worked in the ag business, so I had my agronomy business, and I was involved in a farm management company, and so uh, I learned a lot from this guy. And uh, he would, uh, I would, I'd come to him in my 20s, I'm like, I am wore out. I need a break. I'm about to die. You know, it's 115 degrees outside. And, uh, you know, and he'd look at me and he'd say, the world is run by tired people. That's what he'd tell me. I'm like, okay, I can grasp that one. Uh, but he also had a saying, too. We would be involved in some things, and he'd go, hey, buddy, hey, buddy, hey, buddy. 
We don't want egg on our face. We do not want egg on our face. Now, what that means is we don't want to look bad. Now, you got to get this. So, get this. I'm in my late 20s. I'm going to New York to appear before Goldman Sachs Investments in what I call as a dog and pony show to try to entice them to diversify their portfolio into land property, rural property in the U.S., and so I have a suit, I bought an overcoat, I'd never had one before, okay? And I bought this overcoat, and so we get there. I've never been in a major city before. We get out of a cab, and we are walking down the road. I'm dressed in black. I look like somebody I'm not. I don't know what I look like, but I look like everybody else around there. But it was not who I was. And I kept looking at these buildings, and I kept looking up. And I don't remember what building it was, but I got right up against the side of that building. And I was in my black coat and my black suit and my tie and my shoes that hurt my feet. I'm looking up the side of that building and a taxi cab comes by, rolls the window down and goes, hey, country! Because he knew I wasn't from there. And I can remember, scared to death as I went in there and sat before them. All I was to do was to look nice, keep my mouth shut. I was the agronomist and I hope they didn't ask me a question. Because why? Because I didn't want to get egg on her face. His fear of failing even as a young man. But you know what? We went through it. Didn't quite work out like we wanted, but got through it. If we have a fear of failing, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of where God has you right now. Don't be afraid of what God has you and and what he's doing. God could be molding you and shaping you and building you. And God has you. God has governed your footsteps ahead of you. You just need to listen to him and he'll obey. The enemy may come around and want to speak stuff into your life. Now, he's not behind every tree, every bush. He's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. Uh, He's not like the Lord God Almighty. He's a demonic being. So it's not like an audible voice, but he may try to speak stuff in to say, you're not good enough or you're never going to be able to accomplish. And the Lord says his presence gives us courage to not fear. And and I always say this, one second in his presence can fix you. I know we don't like to look at it that way, but there's all this stuff flying around out here about somebody can do this and do that and all this, but one second in his presence, he can He can fix you. You can have peace in the midst of the storm. You know, one second in his presence, you may realize that you're in a tribulation. You're in a tough spot. You may realize, hey, if God so desires, he has every ability and every authority to deliver me from this tribulation, or he can deliver me through this tribulation. But in the end, he's with me. He's present. He says, and his presence gives us the courage not to fear. So what are you fearing today? Where are you discouraged at today? How have you compared yourself to somebody? If you're doing what God wants you to do, don't worry about it. If somebody's, you know, whatever they're doing to you, maybe on social media, man, get off of it. Don't worry about that stuff. If if you're the child of the king and you're where he wants you to be, hey, be dependent on what he thinks about you instead of what somebody else thinks. And it will just, it'll lift you up. Hey, it'll cause you to have love. And I don't, you say, I'm going to go out here. I'm going to get on that person. I'm going to get on them on Facebook. No, don't do that either, okay? Man, he'll give you the spirit of love and sensitivity. So, what God does is he, he blesses us with his presence, but also with his provision. Now, look here at the last part. I, I use this language. I say, this is kind of, it's the inerrant word of God. It's just wild and how he put this together. So, in verse 6, he basically says this. He says, He says, once again, for a little while, he says, I'm about to shake the heavens and the earth to see, and I'm going to shake all the nations. Then he goes on, he says, and the wealth of the nations is going to come in, and then the glory of this house is going to be greater than the former glory. So, most scholars will say there's about three statements here that's being made. Number one is that the provision of God is in His Word. So, you got to think back about creation. When God spoke everything uh, into existence, said, let there be light. He's talking about shaking the nation, shaking the heavens, shaking the world. It's the the Word of God. And the Word of God is where we find our comfort. The Word of God is where… Can you imagine what it would be like if we didn't have the Word of God? I mean, there'd be no compass. There'd be no true north. There, there would be nothing. I mean, there'd be no absolute truth. We, we would just be all over the board everywhere. It's his word is what, his word shakes us. And, and what all of us need today, I always say this, Lord, give us illumination. Holy Spirit, give us illumination of the scripture. Give us understanding. Basically what I'm saying is, Lord, we need a word from you. Some of us here need a word that shakes us. It shakes us. It may unravel us. It may upheave us. 
It shakes us. That's his word. We need a word of comfort. We need a word of encouragement. We need a word of persevering. We need a word of saying, hey, the Lord reminds us, you matter to me. You're valuable to me. You're my child. We, we got to quit living in this world of, you know, we're living in the past. We can't concentrate on the present. And, and you know, so for instance, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's fair and just to forgive you of your sins and purify you from all unrighteousness. That is the word of God. What some of you may need is a shaking of that verse to remind you, you are not the person you used to be. And that that sin in the past, no longer, hey, it may have those old things of the flesh. You want to reach out and grab a hold of you and tap you on the head and all that stuff. It cannot control you. It cannot rule you. It cannot enslave you because you're a child of the king. You have to confess it. You know what? You may have a friend. You may have a spouse. You may have a family member that anytime you're around them, you know what they want to do? Well, I remember back when. I remember when you wrecked that truck and run it off in the river. I remember when you got drunk. I remember when you did this. You know what? God does not do that. He does not do that. We've been forgiven. We've been clean. He does not hold our sins against us. He said, that may just be a very simple word that you need that shakes you. But now also, he, uh, we see this, he gives us resource, provides us. He says to them, he says, hey, I'm going to bring in the wealth of the nations. That is so wild. Could have been in reference to King Herod's temple that was coming. There's all kinds of stuff in there. But it's a, it's a resources. You may say, hey, Archie, I'm here. And I know last week we talked about giving and tithing. But, man, I just don't make a lot of money. It's not going to amount to much. Do not despise anything. 57 cents of a six-year-old girl who dies two years later. <laughs> don't tell how many times this story's been told. And God used that for his glory. If God's in it, God will take it and God will use it for him. He provides us with the resources in that. But also, too, I believe it's a reference to this provision of the Messiah who was coming. He talks about the, the glory more than the latter and this. I, I believe that's a reference to the Messiah. Ladies and gentlemen, as a believer in Christ, this world is not our home. We are passing through here. Now, we're to be stewards of this home. We're to make an impact in this home that we're here. I mean, this place where we are. We're to impact with the gospel. But this world is not home. One day there's going to be no more cancer. Come on. Amen. One, one day there's going to be no more death. One, one day there's going to be no more of the hurt. Hey, one day you will, there's coming a day in the future. Some of you have been wounded in such a way. There's coming a day in the future when you will never, ever hear Someone say, I don't love you anymore. I have never loved you. Those hurtful words that some of you have experienced in your life, one day that will be no more. You see, that's provision uh, of the Savior. We have a place in heaven. You know, uh, King Solomon's temple, and you just imagine it. You know, you can go back and read and stuff, but the, it's ornate and all this. We're going to be walking on streets of gold. Can you imagine with the broom? That's hard for me. You got a broom. You're out there sweeping a golden street. Your, your ugly feet. But you know, when you get to heaven, you're going to have beautiful feet. Amen? Come on. Resurrected body. So let me rephrase. In heaven, your beautiful feet walking on streets of gold. And we don't deserve that. We can't earn it. It's because that Savior came out of heaven. And came to this earth, born of a virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, went to the cross at Calvary. And hear this, they spit on him. Man, where I come from, you don't spit on people. If you do spit on somebody, you don't get away with that. They spit on him, they mocked him. They mocked him. The one who the Father from heaven spoke, I believe this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him, learn from him. They mocked him. Yet he stayed on the cross. And yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We cannot buy that or earn that. He died on that cross for us. Here's our invitation. Could be today that you say, hey, Archie, I've heard it. And man, I, I got stuff facing. I'm just kind of down. And 
discouraged. Hey, look, there's going to be pastors here and some of our deacons around, folks, and there'll be some ladies pray with the ladies, but you they may just need someone to pray for you, pray over you. It may just be you just want to come, just kneel down, pray by yourself. However, just to, just to give praise of the Lord. Maybe there's some stuff that you just need to confess. You're a believer. You just got to get right with him. Say, Lord, I've been harboring some stuff. I've been hanging on to some stuff. And, and so I would encourage you in the invitation to respond in the appropriate manner, the right way, and the Lord be obedient. It could be that you say, hey, I need to be baptized by immersion. I saw this taking place, and I'm a follower of Christ. I haven't been baptized. We invite you to come. Share with one of the pastors. It could be, say, hey, I want to be a part of a this Bible believing, Bible teaching church, we have a membership class coming up. And so we talk about doctrine in there. And we kind of let you know who we are before you decide this is a place that, you know, you want to be a faithful member of. And so just come tell one of the pastors, hey, I'm kind of interested in that. Pray with me about that and kind of tell me what next steps are. But most importantly, here's what I know. There's some of you here and some of you watching. You have uh, exhausted trying to find fulfillment in the things of this earth. You've exhausted it. You're wore out. You've gone down every path, whether if it's whatever, everything. And nothing, it all lied to you. It said, oh, you do this, it's going to be great. And it wasn't, never fulfilled. You have reached the bottom, and you're just kind of looking around. Well, you need to look up. His name is Christ. You have to come to him in repentance and faith. This is not some kind of weird story from a guy from Prairie County in Bisco, Arkansas. Jesus Christ is the only one who can fulfill. Can you catch fish, go hunt and play golf, eat lasagna? I like lasagna. Can you have all the good things in life? Yes. But nothing fulfills like a Savior. Lasagna can let you down. Golf can let you down. Fish will let you down. Hunting will let you down. I mean, we could just go on. I know we're kind of laughing, but you know what I mean. He will never. Amen. He's the only one who can satisfy and fulfill. But you got to come here in repentance and faith and call upon him. And that's truly, Lord, I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. Lord, I repent. Lord Jesus, save me today. And he'll save you. It's a promise in his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you you tell us in your word, you will not forsake us. Thank you that even in this Old Testament passage you said, and it applies to us today, I am with you. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. I'm with you. And so, Lord, I pray today that we respond, Holy Spirit, we respond however you are leading us. It could just be we just need someone to pray for us, pray over us, pray with us. It could just be we just need to exalt, whatever it may be, Lord could be of salvation, repentance and faith, trusting in the promises of your word. Maybe your word has shook us in such a way that we sense our separation. May that individual call upon you right now. May they not be ashamed of you in any form or fashion. May they come and share with one of these pastors. Today I'm surrendering to Christ. I'm repenting of sin and putting my faith in Jesus. Have your way with us, Lord, in this time. Your name we pray, name of Christ. Amen.